Hi everyone, my name is Max. I'm a field representative with the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals and I'm excited to welcome you to our Safe Staffing Roundtable today where we're going to be discussing issues of safe staffing at UVMMC really throughout the network, so not just at the, at the University of Vermont Medical Center but throughout the network. We are joined today by a panel of nurses and technologists who comprise the members of the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals and we're going to be breaking our event today into two separate sections where first we're going to hear from nurses and technologists in order to get a sense of what safe staffing looks like for folks working in healthcare in this moment and what challenges they face around staffing. We'll take a short break and then we're going to pivot into talking specifically about um, potential solutions to the, the crisis both in terms of the short term as well as the long term. Certainly want to thank our friends at Main Street Landing today for um, hosting us in this beautiful space, uh, as well as um, the Spectrum Youth Services for um, allowing us to use this beautiful furniture as well. Um, so let's dive right into the, 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 this conversation. Before we do so, however, I'd like to have our panelists introduce themselves. So I'll start right over here. Hi, I'm Deb Snell. I'm president of the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals. I'm also a nurse in the medical ICU, and I've been at the hospital for 22 years now. I'm Tracy Deneen. I work um, in the resource department at University of Vermont Medical Center. I've been working there for 12 years, and 10 of those have been on the night shift in the resource department, which means that I float to currently 10 different units um, providing inpatient bedside care. And I'm Lori Draper. I work in the CAT scan department in radiology, and I've been here for 23 years. I'm Sarah Ferguson. I am a nurse in the outpatient neurosurgery clinic, and I've been with the hospital for seven years. Awesome. So as you can see, we have quite a bit of experience here, and we also have representation from a variety of different areas of the, the UVMMC network. Um, so we're going to get some different perspectives, but before we get into that uh, ground level perspective, I'd like to turn to uh, the VFNHP president, uh, Deb Snell, to give us a little bit of an idea of what short staffing looks like in a bigger sense in your hospital right now. So what does that picture look like just from your per perspective um, as in, in a leadership role? What are you seeing in terms of short staffing um, numbers? Well, I mean, it has a direct effect on all of us. Um, nurses are getting burnout. Nurses are getting multiple, multiple phone calls a day begging them to come to work. Um, our LNAs are in the same position, the MAs as well. Um, it's not a pretty sight in the hospital right now. Staff is just stretch to the max right now. Um, I mean, last night in my own unit, we had to call the manager in to come do charge on the night shift because we didn't have enough nurses to staff our unit. That's not a safe situation to be in in an ICU. Yeah, and so are you able to speak to how many vacant positions there are um, that would normally be filled by nurses and, and techs in your union? Yeah, so right now there's about 324 just in union positions at the hospital. I, I have no doubt the number is much higher because we are seeing travelers even in non-bargaining unit positions in phlebotomy and in other areas that we've never seen travelers before. Um, of those, about 290 of them, roughly, are for nurses. Okay, and, and when you say travelers, are you just able, are you able to clarify what, what a traveler is just for folks who may not be in um, the hospital? Travelers are either like nurses or they're technologists that come and work in our facility. Um, they're filling a vacant position that we've been unable to fill and they are paid at quite a higher rate, uh, actually a very much higher <laughs> rate than the nurses at the bedside are making. So that's kind of like, like a kick to that you're working next to someone who is potentially making like 4,200 a week. And that's like all in that pays for part of their housing, any of the extras that they get and their wages. And what would a, a, a member in a, in a nurse or technologist or tech um, role generally make let's, by comparison? Uh, not even half that. Okay, <laughs> all right. Not even half, probably more like a third. 
Okay, so that helps to kind of get give mm. some context around just the scope of the problem as well as some of the economics behind the mm. issue. Um, do you feel like, based on on th those figures, that it's really an issue of money, given that they're given that spending that you just that, that you just put out there in terms of the the cost of of hiring travelers? Well, it is an economic issue, um, not on our part. Um, and we know that the hospital has the money because they're spending the money right now on all of these travelers. I mean, there's over 200, maybe 250 in like, that would be bargaining unit positions that are, ta are in traveler positions right now. Um, and what they're paying them and then what they're paying for overtime, what they're paying for like premium pay, which is like twice our salary because they need to fill holes. Every unit in our hospital has multiple openings for nurses or technologists. Well, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Certainly appreciate that. Um, I, you did start to get into some of the, the, just the impact that it's having on members and what the experience is for a nurse or a tech or technologist who's on the floor, in the hospital, in a clinic, day in and day out. Um, but those numbers, while staggering, certainly don't tell that experience. And so I'm wondering if we can turn to our other panelists right now and just get a sense of what you experience on a daily basis. So I'll start with Tracy and then kind of move our way around. What are some things that you're seeing in your unit? Yeah. So I, like I was saying before, I, tr I float between 10 different units, including cancer, neurology, pediatrics, or emergency department, boarded patients, lots of different things. And a few years ago, I could walk into any of those units and know almost every person I was working with. I would know my support staff, which by that I mean a licensed nursing assistants, respiratory therapists, and then um, my fellow nursing colleagues. Currently, and this is definitely without exception, I know less than 50% of the people I work with. And this is a huge problem because nursing is a team sport. You cannot take care of four to five acutely sick patients by yourself. And when I walk in on a unit and I don't know the skill and ability of my colleagues, it makes it a much more dangerous pace, place for me and my, my patients. And in addition, um, you know, if the charge nurse is responsible for taking um, you know, a really acute patient from the emergency department who's very sick, that he or she is gonna give that patient to me as a fresh admission over someone she doesn't even know. Um, so the experienced staff members currently on the floor are getting the sickest patients we are walking in not knowing the, our colleagues, which means that you know, it's very hard to ask for support if you don't know the people you're working with. Actually, in case they're usually asking you for help all of the time because a traveler gets three days of orientation on an inpatient unit. I mean, it's impossible for them to know policies, protocols, order sets, physicians' preferences. Um, so you're just, it's really hectic. <laughs> I feel like I'm running around like with my head chopped off all the time and I've been here for a long time. So it didn't used to be like that. It's, definitely a, a change. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate the, the getting the imp inpatient perspective from both Deb and, and you, Tracy. I'm wondering if we can turn now to the, the technologist side uh, of things and what you're experiencing, Lori, and CATSCAN in terms of just the incredible load that you and your colleagues are, are bearing right now, given given the staffing issues that are, that are present. Yeah, um, CATSCAN alone has lost 10 technologists out of approximately 30 of us since January of 2021. Um, we're struggling to attract or retain even travelers. They so much as hired us an x-ray traveler to do CT this summer, which is much like hiring an electrician when you need a plumber. It, we end up training these people and then they're gone in three months. Um, and also uh, the urgent staffing text pages that we get on a daily, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, and we've even had them reach out with SOS. We're drowning, they, they have that many patients, they're just drowning, we can't keep up. So, and when there are open shifts, um, the hospital has decided to mandate them. So like myself, I was mandated in August they told me on Wednesday that Saturday or Sunday, 3 to 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. was my shift. Didn't matter that it wasn't mine. Didn't matter that I had to return at 6.30 a.m. Monday morning to then work a 10-hour shift. So I get mandated to work an eight-hour shift, have seven hours off to return to do another 10 hours. It just doesn't seem safe for myself or uh, patients. Well, thank you for that perspective. Yeah. So we've heard a little bit about inpatient as well as the, the technologist side. 
Sarah, you're an, 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 an outpatient nurse, um, which is a different side of things, and I'm just wondering if you might be able to, to talk about what it's looked like in the outpatient world. Absolutely. I, for me, I've been somewhat fortunate in all of this in that I work in a smaller clinic. It's myself and one other nurse, and we're both still with the organization, still in that clinic. But I'll be honest, we have discussed, both of us have discussed leaving. Um, we still discuss leaving, and I think one, if not both of us, when all of this is said and done, will will leave. I most likely will leave the profession in the next few years because of how bad things are. Um, you know, it, it's heartbreaking for us, and, and I know my colleagues in other outpatient clinics are suffering far worse. Primary care is one of those examples. They are running so short-staffed that they're being asked to take shifts after the clinic is closed just so that they can get to the in baskets so that they can get calls back to patients so that patients can get care in some kind of a timely manner um, but like i said it's, it's heartbreaking you know we we got into this field and, and into these professions because we wanted to help people and we wanted to support our community and every single day we're watching our ability to do that disappear and instead we're being asked to scrape the bottom of an empty barrel for scraps to to give people and it's hard it's really hard to wake up every day and know that you're going to go into work you're not going to be able to do your best you're not going to have the resources that you need to provide the care that you want to provide and you're going to go home feeling defeated every day Thank you so much for sharing, and I just appreciate getting those perspectives out there. One of the things that we also want to explore today is recognizing that while the moment in which you all find yourselves is particularly challenging, it didn't happen overnight. This was not a, an issue that um, came out of nowhere or that was um, particularly related to the pandemic. Certainly the pandemic has exacerbated the challenges that you all faced, especially in terms of burnout, but it's not uh, an issue that has necessarily come out of nowhere. And so wanted to turn back to you, Deb, and see if you might be able to share um, what your union has done over the last several years um, and beyond, honestly, to address staffing issues at the hospital and what are some of the factors that have caused staffing shortages in your hospital, throughout the network, and just in healthcare in general? Yeah, so, I mean, even up to like three years ago um, when we were in contract negotiations and the nurses went out on strike, we didn't go out on strike for money. We went out on strike because we had a problem in our hospital retaining and recruiting staff. And we knew that we needed to pay higher wages to get people here. You know, those of us, like I've been there a long time, Lori's been there a long time. I can't speak for you, but I mean, I know I make you know, decent money. If I was living in New York, across the lake in like the Plattsburgh area, I'd be living really well. But the cost of living in our state is a huge issue. So when we talk about money for nurses, we talk about money to attract new nurses here because the new nurses can't afford to live in Vermont. They can't find housing, they're paying their student loan off. It, it's not sustainable for them. So this has been going on for years. I mean, there was a time in my career at the hospital that we actually did have adequate staffing. And then things just seemed to change after the network came in. And we just seemed to be getting the sicker patients from all of the network hospitals. I mean, you feel that too. And we just couldn't catch a break. And people were just like, you know what, I can go somewhere else where I can afford to live. and make the same salary I'm making here and have a better life and be able to provide for my kids better. And that's always what it was about, that we need to pay enough to keep people here and provide them work-life balance because that's what's happening right now is that work-life balance is like this. And that's why we see nurses like Sarah and stop starting thinking about leaving the profession. 
Well, thank you for that, that broader perspective. I'm curious, Tracy, if you might be able to speak to what you've observed in your unit in terms of staffing over time. And you have a pretty unique perspective, as you said before, being a resource nurse who um, gets called or brought into different units um, on different shifts. And so what have you seen in different units during your time at UVMMC in terms of the, the sh staffing issues? And what are some things that you might identify, whether they be, they're similar to what Deb was saying, um, or other factors that you know you've noticed that have have caused that, or that you've heard from colleagues. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, working the night shift. Um, I work the night shift because I have three small children, so it, I tell myself <laughs> it makes it easier with that. But I work with a lot of young new nurses, and I mean, I myself am still paying student loans, and I know they are significantly because it was it's even more expensive for them to go to school. And when you're coming in and getting trained, and then they're working with travel nurses that are making three times, literally three times as much money as they are, why wouldn't they travel? I mean, I could name you 30 nurses off the top of my head that have left within the last 12 months to travel because it doesn't make sense for them to stay here and make such a little amount of money for the same skill set, especially with the housing prices. I mean, I had to move a half an hour out of Burlington to be able to purchase a home and it's still, I mean, I, the house across the street just sold for double what I paid for mine. So it's, it's just not, we're not keeping up with, the, like you said, quality of life here. And I work with, and some of the travels I work with are amazing, but absolutely 100% all of them had said, I would love to live here, but you guys don't even pay remotely enough for me to take a full-time position. They are, we can't, they cannot afford to live here. They're like, it would be such a significant change in my lifestyle, I would never accept a full-time job, which is super sad because it feels like this is never gonna be fixed. We have. 200 plus opening nursing positions, and I don't know people who will come and stay and work here. Wow, wow, that's that, that's that's really uh, that's really striking to hear that. Yeah. You know, in, in terms of that. Um, so I want to turn to you, Lori, and see how have things shifted in in your unit during the time that you've been there. What are th some things that you've noticed uh, in terms of CAT scan um, and just. What, what are things that you and your colleagues talk about when it comes to staffing? With CAT scan, even pre-COVID, um, the increase in the trend of using CAT scan has, has just skyrocketed in the last few years. Um, and the hospital, we, we've actually had oncologists fill out safe reports because we don't get their cancer patients in in time. Um, this is all pre-COVID. And the administration was aware of that, and even then, nobody was doing anything about it. We felt we were drowning before COVID. Then you bring in COVID, and it just, it all snowballed. So it, it, we're just between trying to keep up with all of that, and, and then just, it, it's just people are getting burnt out, like everybody said. And also in radiology, another big issue is they are pretty adamant that we only do eight-hour shifts. And like um, you guys were discussing the work-life balance, a lot of our technologists are really aiming to get 10 and 12 hour shifts um, that the administration has said they, they don't have it in the budget to let us do that. So we've had multiple technologists leave to go do 12 hour shifts and the pay increase, even Dartmouth alone, we had somebody leave for $7 an hour more at Dartmouth. So. So, so it's very much a, 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 a healthcare is very much a competitive marketplace, and you're seeing and that people that. are making those choices yep. based off of that. Yep. Even in the region itself, yes. you're, you're hearing from people that air, other area hospitals are paying more. Yes. Okay, and that's causing people to leave. Correct. Um, what about travelers? Are people leaving to travel too? Is that part of it? Yes, we have young and old, or uh, technologists, both. Um, thinking about the same thing. We've got what I call flight risks. <laughs> We've got two <laughs> right now <laughs> that are definitely, uh, one is he's been around probably 17, 18 years, and then one of our newer ones. So even though we've already lost 10 technologists out of 30, we've got more that are ready to head on out to go travel, specifically for the money. Sure, yep. sure. And given what you've described, you can see why that would yep. be attractive, not only from a push out perspective, but also something pulling people in terms of the money that, that, that they could be making yep. either at another regional hospital or in a sort of short term travel gig. Correct. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, Sarah, I'm just interested if you might be able to talk about what you've observed from the outpatient side of things in terms of the staffing issues over time. I know you've been uh, an active union member for, for quite some time um, and so and have been involved in these staffing conversations. So 
What's your perspective from, from the outpatient side? Yeah, and you know, part of it too is I've been the daughter of a nurse that's worked at the hospital for 30 some odd years. So even when it hasn't been my own personal experience at the hospital, I've, I've listened to her share her stories of, of how things used to be and, and how things have changed over time. And in talking with, with other friends and, and colleagues, it's kind of this, everybody comes back to the same, same story and the same issue of just this decade plus long just consistently having the hospital not listen to us and not hear when we've come to them with issues. I mean, this is a conversation that we have had with them over and over and over again, that we've said to them, things are getting bad. Like we're, we're going to be in this position. This is, this is what our future is going to look like. And blaming it on, on COVID is just, it's not realistic. People right now are not leaving the institution because of COVID. They're leaving because of how management is handling things and how things are being mismanaged. And it's, we've consistently seen that they're just, they're not willing to, to step up and address the issues, address the problems, listen to what we have to say about what the, the issues are, where their priorities need to be. And it's, it's almost this belief that if they don't admit it and they don't say it out loud, that it's not real. But the reality is, is, is that it is real. I mean, these, these are the issues that we're having. And, and a lot of it is, as, as you've heard, competitive wages and having that work-life balance. And right now, competitive wages are even more important because we have the fewest nurses that we've, that we've seen nationwide to, to pick from, so to speak. So we have to get creative in how we get people here and keep people here. And that just is not being listened to. Um, you know, I mean, we have an employer that is, is focused on spending millions of dollars on a surgery center that's gonna be opened years from now when we're hemorrhaging staff right now. We don't have the staff to staff this surgery center. We need to, to focus on what we're dealing with right now and coming to the table and working with us to listen to, to what we need because right now all that's happening is we're trying to fight this battle on our own without the resources that we need. At best, it's gonna take us twice as long to fix, but at worst, we're not gonna be able to fix it. And that to me is just, it's not acceptable. And I have to say for me personally, it's even more upsetting when I think about the number of physicians and nurses that are in high level leadership positions at the hospital that seem to be okay with the fact that we're in this position and that we're drowning. Right, right. It seems like from what I'm hearing you say and what we've seen happen over the last um, several years really is that there's been a, a real focus on expanding the network itself. So purchasing other hospitals, other clinics, expanding the footprint of those clinics and uh, trying to seek out you know, different statuses for, for your hospital and those kinds of things. But that, that hasn't necessarily been uh, reflected or has, has not been conscious of a, a patient care focus. Um, such that you know you all have talked about sort of patients over projects um, that need to focus on patient care and patient experience on a daily basis, um, and so that's the thing that you know we continue to hear um, in examples like all of you have shared, um, but that I want to get into next is and talk about, which is that of you know how, how does staffing impact not only yourselves but the patients that you care for. So what are you hearing from your patients, their families, their friends, the people who are in your clinics or who are in your units on a daily basis? So I'll come to you, Deb, first, and then we'll kind of uh, expand the conversation from there. Well, I think that we're finding that each area is impacting each other. Um, because of short staffing, like a patient in the ICU who maybe is ready to go to the floor isn't going to the floor because they don't have the staff to take the patient and then it gets backed up because there's a patient in the ED that desperately needs that bed, but they're on hold because we're trying to get this other patient out to make room for them. So it's like this vicious circle. I mean, we have patients that wait forever to go to CT and the doctors are calling down there and said, I ordered this stat, but they don't have the staff. Um, so it it is just like this domino effect that's happening in the hospital that 
every area is affected by the short staffing in other areas. And it's not just nursing and techs. I mean, sometimes we're waiting forever for phlebotomy to come for a draw or patients are waiting like up to an hour and a half to get their dinner tray because there's no staff in the cafeteria or nutrition. So it's just, it is, it's just this vicious circle that everyone's feeling and, you know, and it's hard, you're getting upset, like what the heck is going on on this floor that they can't take my patient? And then the ANC comes up and they're like, well, yeah, they're down four nurses. So it, it's just hard that families get frustrated that things aren't happening in a timely manner. And, you know, we do our best and say, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've said I'm sorry to a family in the past year just because they're waiting for something that I have no control over. Right, and that must be particularly frustrating to not have control. It is, and to it is. I mean, there's always, you know, communication between the departments. We do our best to try to keep each other in the loop, but, you know, I mean, our ED is getting killed right now. I mean, Saturday, I like you just, like last Saturday, I just like happened to look and there's like almost 100 patients there. And they're like, what, 43, 45 beds down there technically? You know, and there's 100 patients. And I mean, the charge nurse last weekend took a gun, a loaded gun off a patient in the ED. And, you know, there's like 40, 50 travel nurses down in the ED right now. It, it's just, yeah. I, we could go on. <laughs> we, yeah, we could absolutely. go on and on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But it is. Yeah. It is like all the areas are affecting each other. I mean, Sarah, I mean, all of them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tracy, what have you seen with your with the patients that you've worked with? Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen a dramatic decrease in quality of patient care, which equals, you know, dissatisfaction in your own job. I mean, I don't feel great when I come home. I have... Um, you know, for example, multiple, multiple nights in the last month, I've worked on a unit where there was one um, nursing assistant for 32 patients, which means if you have one patient that needs two people to go to the bathroom, that's 20 minutes, which means that you probably have now three patients with overdue medications, a dressing change that hasn't been done, a super angry family member. I had a family member that I had to talk to for 45 minutes the other night because um, their their father, who was a uh, had a stroke and couldn't talk and it was a choking risk needed to have his food cut up for dinner and it wasn't happening because that that's a that's a small test that's a really big deal and that's the kind of stuff that gets slipped but it's it's massively important and you feel like you don't know how to triage all of these hemorrhages all the time yeah. and I think that as a nurse you can feel very isolated because yeah. you don't know your team which is what we were talking about I mean you don't even know who to ask for help and I, and I think there's a lot of loss of control there. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm wondering if we can get some other perspectives. Lori, are you able to share what you've seen in terms of patient impacts? Yeah, I mean, in CAT scan alone, we've had two rooms permanently shut down all summer because we don't have the staff to staff them. We have five travelers right now, and we still cannot open those rooms back up. So that affects our cancer patients because they're the ones being put off. And it's sad to me that they're not priority anymore. With that said, we were told um, that our numbers were up 40% last month with just emergency department and inpatients. And then, so we're trying to even just juggle those. So now we have that patient that's waiting that's a trauma or a stroke or a pulmonary embolism or a dissecting aorta that they may wait an hour for their scan. And that hour might be too long. And it's just really sad. We are all running as fast as we humanly possibly can, and it's just not fast enough. I mean, I've worked here 23 years, and I have never in my life seen this place this awful, the wow. staffing this bad. Wow. I would agree. Wow. Yeah. Sarah, what about you? What have you seen? Yeah, it's kind of this overwhelming lack of appointments in outpatient right now. I know in primary care, an urgent visit you're looking at a week plus to be able to be seen. Um, specialty care is, is just as bad. We refer some of our patients to other specialties and we're getting messages back saying, well, we can see the patient in April. Well, that's over six months from now. What? And there, there's nothing, there's no other real options for some of these patients. The, the options then become either you overwhelm the urgent care in the ER 
or you, you just sit at home and, and suffer and suck it up and, and wait that six months or, or wait that week to get in for, for your urgent care visit. Um, as Deb said, we all are, are very interconnected and in my department in particular, we rely really heavily on imaging. So on CAT scan, on MRI to treat and diagnose our brain tumor and brain bleed patients. So that means that when they're short, we can't take care of our patients. So now I'm having patients that are calling that have a history of a brain tumor and they're calling and they're symptomatic and they're terrified that their brain tumor's back or that it's growing. And I have to say, I'm really sorry. I know that this is really scary and one of the worst moments of your life right now, but we can't help you until you get new imaging and that's gonna take three months. So then their options are, again, to wait in the ER, which radiology's already backed up and it's not considered a, you know, an emergent life-threatening issue. So they're looking at waiting 12 plus hours in an ER bed to get that imaging, or because the ER is so short-staffed, they can't even get into an ER bed. So they sit in the waiting room for six hours and then just leave um, and, and just don't get the care at all. And, you know, they feel abandoned and they feel like they're not getting the care that, that they deserve and the care that they need. And as the person that's on the triage phone having to tell them that these are their options and give them this, you know, we'll, we can't get you in for your imaging, it feels like I'm the one that's abandoning them. And that doesn't feel good. And that hurts um, a lot. You know, the patients don't care about the projects. They don't care about the things that we're gonna do years from now. Those, those are, are great, and I think that there are a lot of things that we can look to the future to help build the organization and help take, a, take care of our patients. But today, right now, they care about the fact that they're not getting the care that they deserve, the care that they need, and the care that we promised them. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to all of our, our, our panelists um, for this first section and for sharing your experiences um, from a variety of different areas of the UVMMC network. It's particularly helpful for um, members of the public and for other colleagues who are in their units and may not get a sense of that broader perspective, I think, to, to have this this converse, this wider range conversation. So I just want to thank Tracy, Lori, and Sarah for joining us for this first section. Um, we're going to be taking a short break here um, and bring on some policymakers for our second section, which will be talking more to the solutions to this, this, this issue, both in the short and longer term. So we're going to take a brief break here while we switch out our panelists. I again want to just thank um, Tracy, Lori, and Sarah for joining joining us. Really appreciate um, just given you know all the pressure that you're under um, in your units, making time um, on a Sunday to just come and join us and, and share your perspective. Um, you know, it's not a nice perspective necessarily to hear, but it's a super important perspective to get out there. So thank you so much. Um, and we'll be right back with you with our second segment where we'll talk about um, some of the solutions that we're working on um, to this crisis as a union. Thank you. And I hope you have a good shift at work now. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We um, just heard from a number of nurses, both inpatient and outpatient, as well as a technologist. Um, we continue to be joined by uh, our president, Deb Snell, um, here today, but um, we've switched uh, out our panel and we have some new guests joining us. So I'm gonna just turn to, to, to our new guests um, who have, have come today and I just wanna thank all of you for coming. We have some Vermont, great Vermont policymakers here, both from the House as well as the Senate side. And so I'll just turn to you and have you introduce yourself before we get into some of the questions. Uh, I'm Kurt McCormick and I represent the Old North End and downtown of Burlington. Uh, I think we're in my district right here. 
I'm Thomas Chittenden. I am in the State Senate. I represent the Chittenden Senate District, so that's Chittenden County minus Colchester and Huntington. I also serve on the South Burlington City Council, and I am a proud member of the United Academics, which is also a, an affiliate I, great, of uh, AFT. I'm Selena Colburn, also a United Academics um, AFT member, so really happy to be here in solidarity and support with folks. And I represent in the House Burlington's Chittenden 6-4 district, which actually includes the UVM Medical Center <laughs> is in my district. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being here. Really appreciate it. So you all got to, a chance to see and hear from uh, our panelists in the first round. So I'm just curious um, if you might be able to just offer your reactions to what you heard in that first round uh, of commentary um, before we kind of dive into some of the, the solutions. So I'll start with you, Kurt. What, what were some of your takeaways from the, the first part of the, today's event? Well, I didn't realize how severe the problem is, although I'm, I'm not surprised because I have been a a patient for the past year, uh, past 14 months at the hospital, um, in and out, in for a couple of weeks, um, and major surgery and a lot of other treatment. And um, uh, yeah, the, the nurses, I mean, I don't say this to brown nose anybody, <laughs> but the nurses, I even get choked up even talking about it. They were just great. They work really hard and, um, uh, you know, when you're having problem getting somebody, mm -hmm. It's, it's obviously not uh, his or her fault. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and actually I've, I, I was trying to count sitting here. I think I've had 13 CAT scans in the past 14 months, <laughs> all of them except for two here. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a problem. And sometimes, you know, you're, you're, the results are very important to you and mm -hmm. you have to wait. Um, it's, it's no fun just waiting. So, uh, and I have, I have a question, just, um, just a little bit of the jargon. Um, when you say you're mandated, what does that mean? Um, that means that you are being told that you are working, period. That you have to work. That you have okay. to work. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then I appreciate you sharing that perspective of both, you know, being in an elected role, but also, you know, being someone who has sought care at the hospital and really relied on that care in the last year. I think that's an important perspective to, to, to have in the conversation. So thanks for sharing that. Um, Senator Chittenden, what about yourself? What did you take away from the, the earlier portion of today's event? A uh, few things. I, I would echo what I just heard uh, Representative McCormick say, which is I saw in Sarah Ferguson's comments at the end how much she's advocating for the patients and how that really truly uh, emotionally is where she's coming from as she's working to make sure the patients are taken care of. I also heard Lori Draper talk about uh, a concern that I, I wanted to pick apart a little bit, that you've lost 10 out of 30 technologists in the CAT scan department. And I think I, I heard two reasons why, but partly I'd love to validate or at least explore them a little bit more. Um, one, I, I feel like the retention issue might be that we're not treating our employees well enough. Um, Richard Branson, for all of his faults, has a great quote that I always like, that you want to train people well enough so that they leave, but treat them well enough so that they stay. And so I'm, I, I would love to know what we could be doing differently. As in, in my preparations for this discussion today, a quick Google search, I, I'd love to know what we're doing for mentoring programs, for career advancement tracks, if any, and what we should be expanding upon that. And then a larger conversation which um, I don't know if we'll have time for today, is, is how can we get the University of Vermont and Vermont State Colleges to better address uh, clinical placement programs and to make sure that we have enough opportunities for students to learn, to, to become nurses through our education programs. I have one story in my inbox from about a year ago with a very qualified, very sharp Vermont student applied to the University of Vermont nursing program and wasn't admitted, that there was a cap. And if there are students left at the door, they, they end up studying something else because they couldn't get into the nursing program. So we need our public higher education institutions to meet the, the nursing needs that, as I did my quick Google search, is anticipated to grow by about 7% annually for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, the other part that I heard as for retention is the affordability crisis in Vermont. And I think every elected representative that's run for office knows how to speak to this and what we can do. I, I've heard, of, I read the Vermont Futures Project. I have some ideas on how to address affordable housing, but I always like to broaden the conversation. It, it is about affordable housing and housing that's affordable, but it's about affordable living, which means yeah. affordable transportation, which means a, a, a 
affordable, a, a pay that you can actually put something away, put your kids through college, and otherwise provide for your loved ones, your personal uh, goals, and, and so on. So I have some thoughts on that, but I don't want to talk too long, and uh, I'll wait till the moderator brings the conversation back. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And, and Representative Colburn, what about yourself? What did you take away from today? Yeah, I mean, boy, I like Kurt, I, I've, um, been in the hospital over the year. I was born in that in the <laughs> UVM Medical Center Hospital, um, but I've been there over the years with family member with the birth of my kids, with family members at the end of the life, their life with family members facing really tough moments and um, medically, and just the consistent um, dedicated care of the nursing staff and others there I can't say enough about so in praise of so it just is really discouraging as someone who stood on the picket lines with yeah. nurses a number of years ago when they were not that many years ago but years ago when they were waving the flag and saying we need to pay competitive wages we are at a crisis point now and it's only going to get worse and to have gone through all of that as a community, and I think so many of us showed up and really tried to send the message as a community that we are here with the nurses and want the administration to listen, and then hear that the situation has only worsened, that the um, safety issues have only gotten worse, is really disheartening. Um, and so, yeah, I'm eager to continue talking at this panel mm -hmm. and beyond to really figure out how we can deliver more of a, a wake up call. And I know um, to many of Senator Chittenden's ideas, just the, the one thing that I hope we will get to talk about a little bit when we move into some of the policy solutions is really looking at the question of executive and frontline worker pay issues because mm -hmm. I, we cannot talk about the situation <coughs> at the medical center without talking about that. It's one of the most acute examples in the state yeah. of those disparities. Certainly, absolutely. And I appreciate that you talked about sort of that that process of, of trying to collaborate with upper administration and trying to work with, with folks in, in, a, in a way that gets us towards solutions, because I know that VFNHP has been making that attempt in good faith to work with the administration over not only the last several months, but really several years um, to, to really move this issue forward and try and make not only members' lives uh, easier and better in terms of their ability to provide care, but mm -hmm. then certainly also our community more broadly. So, yeah. um, Deb, I'm wondering if you might be able to speak towards what your union has, how your union has engaged around this issue of state uh, of, of staffing. Um, you know, in the last in the last year in particular, um, recognizing that the that the, that staffing has grown uh, increasingly dire mm -hmm. um, over that past year. Yeah, I mean, we hear from our members all the time. You know, and I get emails and phone calls that are like devastating to have to listen to and answer um, about how bad their working conditions are. And we recognize the large number of travelers we have in our institution. Um, and when Tracy said that she would go on a floor and not recognize 50% of the people, I feel the same way. I would go around like, Talk to someone. I'm like, oh, you're a traveler. Sorry. Oh, you're new. Oh, hi. So it was. It was just really hard. And um, so we um, talked to our upper administration um, and said, you know, things need to change. And because of COVID, we had asked for like a one-year contract extension because we didn't want to be putting patient care on the back burner to be bargaining at the table. Um, so we went to them, um, we engaged our members, and we went and we asked for a 10% increase to our base wages. And I know that sounds like a lot, but when you look at what other places are paying around the country now, the sign-on bonuses, I mean, our own institution for the uh, OR was paying a $20,000 sign-on bonus, and we're still not attracting enough people. They still only had a few people come into that role since then. So 10% didn't seem totally off the mark when we went to speak with them. Um, they were not interested <laughs> in that. Um, but since then, we've had further conversations and we're hopeful because, I mean, we're gonna be bargaining next year. I, I understand that completely, but we can't wait. 
it's like Sarah said, it is right now. People are leaving daily. Like on my unit alone, I just found out about three people who are cutting their hours or leaving. And they're gonna travel, and they're not even gonna travel that far. They might travel to New Hampshire or take another job in Vermont, but it makes more money than it is staying in our institution right now. So we're still working on it. We're still hopeful we can come to some kind of agreement with the administration, just a step in the right direction to at least put the lid on everyone leaving right now. Right, so you're saying that there, there's a need to act in the short term to address the, the, the situation yes. and that what you put across was the, the, te the, the proposal mm -hmm. to raise base wages yes. by 10% um, for all nurses and techs. Correct. Okay, and that was that proposal was not accepted at this point? Correct. Or, so the status of that proposal is that it's been essentially- It's in limbo right it's now. It's in limbo yeah. right now. <laughs> okay, all right. So you've, you all have worked collaboratively to try and, and work on solutions. You didn't get a response like, okay, you said 10, but we can't do 10 necessarily. What about you know a, a different, you didn't even get a response, right? No, we didn't. And you know, I mean, we did the numbers. We knew how much it would cost the hospital roughly. I mean, they have like, what, a $1.5 billion budget and about almost 700 million of that is on salaries and wages. Um, and what we were asking for maybe totaled 15 million, which when you're looking at 1.5 billion, that's kind of a drop in the bucket. Right, right, exactly. Well, so recognizing that, I'm just, I wanna turn back to, to our representatives and, and, mm -hmm. and Senator Chittenden here to just get a sense of what are your reactions to that? You know, hearing that we, we have some, some short-term ideas for short-term solutions, what do you think about that, um, that issue? I know we've seen that, um, that issue play out um, you know, in, in, in terms of this, this union. And so I just wanted to turn to you, Representative Colburn, and just see what do you think of that, 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 that ask that's been put forward um, in terms of addressing the crisis in this moment right now? I mean, I think there should uh, clearly be some conversation and dialogue and negotiation happening around this. To your point, I, I couldn't agree more with your point that um, waiting another year for the formal collective bargaining process to start, you know, having read just in, as I was getting ready to join this conversation, I was reading the recent seven days cover story from last month about just the experience mm -hmm. of patients in the hospital, the wait times, the um, lack of diagnoses that people were getting sometimes in really serious and life-threatening situations. Um, so this is, this is for sure a, a worker issue and a worker's rights issue, but this is much bigger and the commitment of the nurses here today made that very clear. This is about the health and safety of Vermonters mm -hmm. who are seeking care at the UVM Medical Center and its network. And you know that we've gotten to a point where the network mm -hmm. controls access to most of the healthcare in the yeah. state. Um, and if that's if that's their their goal and their plan and their vision, vision they they have a responsibility mm -hmm. here to step up um, in this moment. Yeah, and then, I don't know, to the, so I'll just stop there and let okay. others yeah, talk. And, cool. There's yeah, some things sure. I could yeah. come back to, but. All right, well, well Senator Chittenden, what, what, what about yourself? What it, you know, hearing what you've heard about sort of how this, this conversation has played out in terms of the, 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 the nurse and text union and the, the conversation with the, the medical center itself, what are some of your thoughts on, on that um, conversation, specifically around these short-term solutions that have been put on the table? Well, it seems clear to me and just about everybody that's been in this pandemic, which I think is everybody, uh, that nurses, teachers, frontline, all essential workers uh, deserve to be paid more and that we need to pay them, we need to keep them, and that ties into the, um, the aspects of how to retain your workforce. So mm -hmm. it seems to make sense uh, from everything I've heard to uh, put 10% more uh, raise. I, I would say this, since I've seen both sides of this, as I know many others in negotiating with uh, uh, labor contracts, I would be curious what some of the rationales might be and if they're looking at a, a way to make it more um, uh, targeted or at all incentive-based. Uh, I'm not uh, siding with that approach, mm -hmm. but what I'm, I'm hoping is that the administration knows that our nurses need to be paid more money, just like our teachers and all of our frontline workers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Deb, did you want to speak to that at all? No, I, I agree. And um, it is, you know, we're asking for our members because that's the only person I, the only people I can speak for are our members but it goes down the chain. It is all of our support staff, our secretaries, 
the food service workers, you know, everyone in the hospital is, you know, suffering right now. And it's not like the nurses and techs got hazard pay. We didn't during the pandemic. Um, yeah, it, it needs to be across the board. It, it just absolutely does. I mean, I see the food service people and they're like rushing trying to let trays and they're and like people are calling and it's like I asked for a milk a half an hour ago and it's like oh my lord you know mm -hmm. I feel so bad that everyone f just feels like that burden yeah absolutely well Representative McCormick what about what are your your thoughts on well, these, some of these sh these short-term solutions I, I, I think I'm sort of hoping that I heard you wrong before <laughs> did you say that a traveling nurse cost us twice as much as a oh, staff nurse more than that so when we have a traveling nurse mm -hmm. working, doing the same thing that mm -hmm. um, what we would call a regular nurse, staff nurse, yeah. a staff nurse, um, that's costing the hospital more than twice as much. Yeah. The average, um, <laughs> the travel nurses in our hospital now are making anywhere from 90 to $140 an hour. Yeah, so that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah. And um, I mean, I, I suppose a traveler deserve some you know, something for that the fact that they're traveling I guess but mm -hmm. but um, I would think that's the best argument for a 10% mm -hmm. increase well and the sad part it's, is right now is even what we're offering travel nurses we're not able to even fill those because it's so competitive I have to, I have to agree many times I would mention to a nurse that mm -hmm. I live a mile and a half from from where mm -hmm. I was in the hospital and and she wasn't familiar with Burlington yeah <laughs> She didn't, she never heard of the old North End? No. Nope. <laughs> right, right, which is an important yeah. impact because, yeah. you know, you, when, you ha when you have full-time yeah. staff, they know their community, yeah. and by nature of that, they know what their, pa they know their patients better, yeah. and I would expect yeah. would be better equipped to, to, to train They're them. more invested, you, yeah. Yeah, because when you know them, that's, that's, a, that's a, a lot yeah. easier thing to do. Yeah, we um, have a lot of traveling nurses up there. I, I believe I met a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally fine. We, you know they're, they're we doing them. The, we need <laughs> yeah. the role that they're doing, but I think that the reality is that that, that there's a big difference between a staff nurse and a, and a traveler yeah. um, at UVMMC and just at any hospital for that matter. Yeah. Well, the diff biggest difference is what they cost us. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So again, to that point, it's not necessarily like we're here. We continue to here. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily about money. It's yeah. really about priorities and where mm -hmm. you're choosing to put those budget yeah. th those budget dollars. Yeah. So. One piece that I did want to get into, and Deb, you touched on this a little bit in the first segment, which is that you were talking about the, the, some of these bigger issues that we talk about and that go into the, those, the, the solutions that you're putting on the table. Um, you know, those, those bigger economic, educational, social factors that have mm -hmm. brought us into this, th this situation. I know, really appreciated Senator <coughs> Chin and some of the, the, the context that you provided in that sense. So, Deb, I'm just wondering if you might be able to touch on some of those, those bigger issues that, yeah. you know, we're going to certainly need to, to address not only in the short term, but mm -hmm. that are going to be influential in the longer term when it yeah. comes to um, addressing this, this, this issue of the staffing challenges at UVMMC and in healthcare more broadly. Yeah, well, a big part of the issue is that um, all of our state colleges have waiting lists of hundreds of people waiting to get into their nursing program. Um, I mean, we know that UVM um, has a lot of like out of state students um, and VTC has an LPN, um, RN and BSN program and they have several hundred people on their wait list trying to get in. It's difficult for them. Um, first, they don't have the space for that many students. And then finding the clinical where these nurses have to go and train, there's just not a lot of uh, places to choose from to go to. So we need to expand the nursing programs. Um, nurses are, and one of the reasons nurses are traveling, like I said, is because of their student loans. Their student loans are killing them right now. I was talking to a couple of nurses yesterday. I was just like, how much are you paying for a student loan right now? Anywhere between four and 800 a month, you know? And they're like 23, 24, 25 years old and still having to live with mom and dad because they can't even get out <laughs> and they don't wanna be there anymore. But that's the reality. I would love personally to see, and I've been talking about this for years, something where we let a Vermont 
student go into a Vermont school, train, and if they agree to stay in our state and work for like five years, that they get tuition forgiveness. We need to really think outside the box. We really need to figure it out because we're only graduating less than like 400 RNs a year in our state. And we need, what, thousands in the next few years? So we're a small rural state, but we have a big need for healthcare staff. It's like physicians as well. About how many Absolutely. retire per year? Um, I'm not, I, I can't speak on a big level. I do know like right now at our hospital, we have roughly 1,800 nurses and honest to God, that number like changes every day from people leaving and coming. Um, there's about, I think I counted, there was like 132 of them that could retire tomorrow that are 65 or older that are still working in our, uh, at the medical center that could just be gone tomorrow. And I think if you add another year to that, it gets closer to like 250. We wow. have an aging, you know, not only an aging population that we're taking care of, but nurses are an aging population as well. Right, and so recognizing those, those factors, I, I think about that seven day story and one of the things that one of the imaging technologists said in that story was that, you know, we've heard as an excuse that there are these issues in healthcare and that, that, we're, feel, that we're feeling the impacts of these at the local level, mm -hmm. but that by nature of those shortages, you can't just say there's an, an issue. You have to recognize that there are these issues and in the short and long term plan for those mm -hmm. issues and, and really create uh, systemic solutions to those problems. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, just wanted to come to you, Senator Chittenden, because you were raising some of those issues and when, when you first mm -hmm. um, reacted and just wanted to come back to you and see if there were things you wanted to expand on or other pieces that, um, you know, that, that you were hearing from Deb. Um, that you wanted to, 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 to raise. So Deb, I serve on the Senate Education Committee and I, I love that idea. I, I love the idea that if, regardless if they're out of state or in state Vermont students, if mm -hmm. they stay and work in Vermont, um, I would love the state of Vermont to pay their, mm -hmm. uh, to a certain extent with nuances and get into the details of how that mm -hmm. works, pay their student loans back uh, if they stay and work here in the great state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. If you move out of the state, then that benefit can go away. Um, exactly. That seems to make a lot of sense. It aligns our public need to have health qu qualified health care workers. It also gets our education institutions that are funded by the state, which I also think we need to increase, but I'm all for tying strings to that <laughs> increase to uh, align with uh, what we want, where we want the dollars to be spent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Representative Colburn, what about your, yourself? What, what kinds of things are you thinking about in relationship to the, these broader structural issues that we're facing, whether educationally or in terms of affordability? Um, yeah. what, are, what are some things that you took away from that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've introduced a couple of bills that really, uh, and working with colleagues in the Senate that look at just restructuring our entire education financing system. So our K through 12 education financing system is really built on a property tax model. Um, increasingly, there's a call for us to move to an income model that really would be a much more equitable solution. So you wouldn't have these folks at the highest end of the income level who are paying these just really small portions of their income into our education system. And there's been some modeling by the Joint Fiscal Office that if we made that shift, we could also deliver substantively more investments back into higher, educa or higher education system as well. Um, one of those models actually, and I worked with AFT and others on this, um, indicated that we might be able to provide free tuition at, at state mm -hmm. colleges um, with that kind of shift. So really not being afraid of the big structural changes mm -hmm. around education funding and looking at solutions to get more of that money into higher into our higher education system. We have one of the most woefully underfunded public higher education oh, yeah. systems in the country. So certainly that. Um, another big structural change that I think is important is looking at this question of equitable pay. So I'm really interested in there are um, some municipalities and some other places around the world that have actually looked at kind of executive and worker pay ratios um, and created sort of mandates or, te or um, revenue generating sources mm -hmm. for you know institutions who are not willing to kind of cap the executive pay or bring up the worker pay to make sure that we're not operating with these 
20 to 1, 30 to 1, 40 to 1, 50 to 1, 100 to 1 ratios. And we know that the um, very top of the chain, the executives at the hospital make huge amounts of money um, compared to some of the lowest paid workers. I you know, was in a legislative breakfast a few years ago right on the other side of the last bargaining agreement and the strike where um, part of that agreement was really to bring up the wages of the very lowest paid workers, yeah. which just as you've all said, has a ripple effect yeah. too on all of these staffing issues. And um, John Brumstead, who famously makes you know over a million dollars, essentially said, right, <laughs> Closer, yeah, two it million dollars. Right <laughs> it's almost like two. Yeah, <laughs> two. yeah, okay, closer so. to the range of two, especially when you figure in all those benefits <laughs> yeah. and and um, and so he told this group of legislators, well, yes, we committed to getting to folks to fifteen dollars an hour, but it's we're really trying not to rush that because we don't want to put too much pressure on the local business community so essentially was saying like mm. we don't want to create yeah. competitive wages and I just had this very visceral you know nothing against anybody as an individual mm -hmm. human being but I just had this reaction of like maybe don't have the person who makes two million dollars tell us that you're going to take your sweet time getting people up to fifteen dollars an hour well and that's the thing it's like at our hospital the starting pay is fifteen an hour at Dartmouth, like even for like the LNA level, and I take that very personally because my son's an LNA. <laughs> um, they're starting them at eighteen twenty-five an hour. And yeah. if you look at the salary for nurses in our state, I think on a national level, just salary we rank like twenty-six. But if you add in cost of living, we rank either forty-six or fiftieth, depending on the study. And when young nurses are looking for a place to go work and live, that's not going to attract them here so I mean it is like the cost of living it is the housing market here and Absolutely. that study you know the it's been showing that I think even since our last contract negotiation we've ranked in that bottom five and with the housing market the way it is now it's not getting better for anybody Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Well, Representative McCormick, yep. um, I wanted to turn to you and see if you know you had uh, additional thoughts to, to to add about these longer-term solutions mm -hmm. and these structural factors. That yes, I, I feel like I'm falling into the pattern of uh, a committee uh, hearing, <laughs> and you are the witness. Yes. Um, so, um, and which is great. So I think I've heard some good ideas from Deb. Um, property taxes are a major problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been working. I don't want to tell Selena how long I've been working on trying <laughs> to do uh, income instead of property taxes, but we can we can we can do a major tweak to the uh, to the present system uh, and have it rely uh, uh, more on income than it does on your mm -hmm. property value. Uh, that's a real problem. Um, uh, getting people into the state if if they take the time to look into our property taxes, mm -hmm. we're we're very high yeah. um, compared to other states. So. Um, I really like your education proposal, um, and I'd like to talk to you more about whatever else um, mm -hmm. you think we you think we can do. Yeah. But remember, your your best argument is that those um, not temporaries, where we, um, the traveling, these travelers yeah. <laughs> are, are costing us a fortune. Apparently, <laughs> so. Right. Exactly. Well. Oh, I, if I could, yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I I have to say that. Um, you know, I, I wrote to the CEO at the guy at the hospital to just talk mm -hmm. about a particular, um, I think she's a physician's assistant, um, and mm -hmm. know, just how incredibly great she was. And, um, uh, but I couldn't help, I said, I, I can't write to you without complaining about some of the crazy pay that some people get at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, he never wrote back. <laughs> but, uh, and this is probably six, six months ago I wrote this letter. So um, he didn't accidentally sign my name, did you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think I think salaries in an institution like this mm -hmm. of uh, of that size are obscene. Yeah, they're embarrassing, and they're demeaning to those that make fifteen bucks an hour yeah. at the same institution. Yeah. And the I'm sorry to no, interrupt, but the no, the please. irony <laughs> is that those of us who have questioned those upper level salaries. Um, at places like UVM Medical Center, what we're told is we know, 
but we need to be able to have a competitive <laughs> salary yeah. to attract someone yeah. into this role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like right to the gut. <laughs> right to the gut, I would imagine. And I don't buy that argument. <laughs> I, if, if I could say quickly, yeah, go ahead, yeah. when I was on the UVM board, just one other member and I were, were fighting for lower paid for the, the new president, mm -hmm. when we were looking for a new president. Mm -hmm. And I did some research about this. And at the time, about a year ago, the highest paid president of any university in the country, the board was trying to get rid of him. Not because of the pay, because he wasn't a good president. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't agree with this. You know, competing with the other people that make obscene salaries to get a good mm -hmm. president or CEO into the area. I think um, uh, we want somebody that cares to do the job yep. more than that, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for these reactions. Certainly appreciate um, this conversation and the discussion and just. Um, you all just coming in and um, how you listened to, to, to what you heard earlier and were able to offer some really thoughtful reactions. Really appreciate that. Before we wrap up, I just want to turn back to you, Deb, and see if you had any final thoughts that you wanted to offer about um, the, the fight that you're in and, and some mm -hmm. of the, the, the path forward um, out of this, 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 this challenging situation around staffing. You know, I mean, the ultimate goal here is to just like raise awareness with the public so they know what's going on, but also, I don't want to go into work every day in an adversarial relationship. That is not the goal of this. The goal of this is to partner with the hospital to improve work-life balance for like all their staff and to even maybe come together for better solutions on how we can get people here. Um, we've been having some of those conversations, but I think, like I said, we, we need to move now. Um, Everything is a committee, that's a committee, that's a committee that takes forever to get anything done. <laughs> and um, we frankly don't have time. We, we do not have time, we're out of time. We need to do something now. Well, thank you so much for yeah. that perspective. And again, thank you to our panelists, Representative Colburn, Senator Chittenden, Representative McCormick, and then of course, AFT, presi uh, AFT president and also VFNHP president, yeah. uh, Deb Snell for joining us. Also wanna go, go back and thank our uh, first group of panelists, um, both uh, our, our nurses, Sarah Ferguson and uh, Tracy Deneen, as well as um, our uh, CAT scan technologist, Lori Draper. Appreciate all of you taking time out of your weekends on this beautiful fall day for coming inside and having a, a, a conversation about a really important uh, topic and issue facing our community and our state more broadly. We really appreciate that. Also want to thank our colleagues um, here at Main Street Landing who have hosted us so graciously. Um, this space has been absolutely wonderful. It's really nice to be back down in this space mm -hmm. um, and having an event here again. Um, it's really exciting for that. And then want to thank um, Spectrum Youth and Family Services who was so gracious in lending us this furniture to use today. Um, it's really helpful to have this um, this year. So just want to thank them and encourage folks um, to check out that organization. Um, and if you're so, so inclined to um, offer donations to them. They're just an absolutely incredible organization that again provides that frontline support to community members in need, much like the nurses and techs uh, that make up the Vermont Federation of Nurses and Health Professionals. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, we'll certainly have a, a, a variety of other actions and steps coming out of this conversation. Um, while this is a conversation, there's going to be many other ways for members um, to, to participate, um, the, those folks who are working at the hospital, as well as community members. So please stay tuned as we are working on uh, and working through these issues as to ways that you can, you can participate and that you can help to, to, to find solutions to the staffing issues that uh, nurses and techs at UVMMC face. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your weekend, everyone. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thank you all.